I'd like to talk now about read and write barriers. This basically has to do with optimizations that both compilers and CPUs do. Just as a quick example. So let's say we have two threads. All right, yeah, two threads in different CPUs. And so on CPU one, we say something like, so to begin with, let's say x is 5 and y is 3, okay? And we now assign x equals 7 and y equals 4. So the question is, on CPU 2, if we go ahead and print x and y, what might print out? So as you'd imagine, the print might happen before the assignment to x and y. So we might get 5 and 3. That's not unexpected. As well, the print might happen after the assignments to x and y, and so we might get 7 and 4. But there are other options as well. One option, not as surprising, is the assignment to x takes place, and so we get the new value of 7 and the old value of y. But what might not be so apparent is that we could also get the old value x and the new value of y. How does that happen? Well, that happens from two possible different optimizations. So we have optimizations that are happening in the compiler and in CPUs. So, and the CPUs are, of course, architecture dependent. So some CPUs or some types of architectures will do certain types of let's say, optimizations that others don't necessarily do. But the compiler, this could work on any architecture. So in C, for example, uh, the compiler is free to reorder the order of stores that happen. As long as, in both these cases, the optimizations basically say we're not going to change the behavior as long as no one else is changing these values. So the optimizations work great in a single CPU system where we ignore or, or, or aren't concerned about like interrupt drivers. That is, we are uh, not going to assume basically that X and Y are changing other than from this CPU and other than in this code. If that's the case, then both the compiler and the CPU's optimizations are great. You can't tell the difference. So if the order of these changed, that should make a difference in subsequent code. But once you throw in another CPU, that's no longer the case. So how could this happen? Well, again, as I said, the compiler could do this. And for the compiler, basically, your, your options are, if you didn't want this, you could turn off optimizations, or you could carefully use language features that uh, tell you at what point sort of things will be synchronized. So you can set up uh, and, and use particular C language constructs to do that. When you're talking about the architecture, it's sort of a different story. So there are architectures. The x86 doesn't happen to be one of them. But there are architectures that will store out of order. How do you prevent? So the way you can think of it, right? why does this all happen? This all happens because of the fact that the CPU is basically going through and executing not just one instruction, it has a pipeline of instructions that are happening. And we'll go ahead and both speculatively uh, carry out uh, instructions. So those are ones that it might have to undo later. Um, but it can, this out of order execution improves its performance. So there exists something called a write barrier. So this is for CPUs. A write barrier says all, all stores that are done before the barrier before the barrier will appear to other CPUs before further stores. So the way to think of it, let's add a write barrier here. So if we had a write barrier here, that will basically 
Still before the write barrier, the CPU can go ahead and reorder any stores that happen. And by stores, I just mean assignments, right? Assignments to memory locations. But it can't move any of those assignments past the write barrier. So what that means is by the time we do the store of y equals four, the store of x equals seven will have happened. So this is without a barrier. And then if we look with a barrier, so actually let's be more specific here uh, because there are read and write barriers. So let's say with a write barrier, could we get five and three? Yes, the print of x and y could happen before any assignment happens. So we could get five and three. Could we get seven and four? Yes, the print happens after all the stores happen. So we can get a seven and four. Can we get a seven and three? Uh, yes, because we could go ahead and see the seven and the three, right before the assignment of y equals four happens. Can we see a five and a four? This is counterintuitive, but yes, we can see the five and the four. And I'll explain why. So although the stores have happened in the correct order, there's another kind of optimization that can happen. So optimization number one that the CPU can do is it can reorder stores. Optimization number two is it can reorder loads. So if we imagine this print XY is gonna, let's say, load X into, into some register, load Y into another register, and then push those on the stack, the order of those loading X into register, loading Y into register can change. And in fact, that is something that x86 will do. So although x86 doesn't do this reordering of stores, it will do the reordering of loads. So in CPU, what, what can basically happen is we have something like, you know, move x into eax, move y into ebx, push eax, ebx. And the problem is that these two may come out of order. All right, so let's say this was a situation where we wanted to rule out 5, 4. So presumably what we could do is go ahead and load y first and then x. And so what if we, we did that, actually? So let's go ahead and load y and then load x. If we load y and then load x, then we would presume that we could get 5, 3, we could get 3, 7, or we could get 4, 7, but there's no way to get 4, 5. So 5, 4. Uh, but that's not true, and the reason for that is that this ordering, even though we specified in a particular order, could be reordered. So we still haven't gotten rid of the possibility of 5, 4. And I'm going to give you some real life examples where this would matter, because in this particular example, maybe nothing matters that much. Um, but the solution would be a read barrier. If we add a read barrier, so if we have a write barrier and a read barrier, then this one can't happen. So we can't get the 5-4 situation. So we would either see the entirely old, the entirely new or the old one that we assigned to first and read second and the new one that we assigned to afterwards. So let's look at some examples where this begins to be a problem. So let's look at one case it's a problem. So let's say we have CPU1 and CPU2. So CPU1 does something like this. X equals 5, done equals true. And CPU says if done, print x. Okay. You would expect x is going to be 5, but that's not necessarily the case. It might be its old value. And that's due, again, to the lack of both a write barrier here and a read barrier here. So if we wanted to actually make this work, we would do a write barrier. So that might be, for instance, some C routine that emits a write barrier instruction. 
and a read barrier. These, this would be correct, but both of those would be needed. So this is called a control dependency because we've got basically a test of one uh, ver value uh, variable and then that's affecting another. So a test of something we've loaded before we we're looking at something else we've loaded. There is another type of dependency that I'll look at. So uh, again, on x86, we don't need a write barrier because the order of the stores isn't going to change, but we would need the read barrier. And in general, if you look at something like Linux, they work on a variety of architectures, so they have to basically cater to the lowest common denominator. So since there are architectures that have write barriers, they go ahead and have this WRB. And that then is going to just be a macro that is going to be dependent on what architecture you're compiling for. So if you're compiling for x86, this write barrier would be um, turned into a no op. And, and that's not exactly quite true because really on x86, that WRB, right, we want a, not a barrier not only for the CPU, but we want a barrier for the compiler as well. So this macro is going to turn into a barrier for the compiler that says don't uh, swap any stores uh, across this boundary. Uh, and the same thing over here, don't cross any loads uh, across this boundary. Um, but it doesn't need to issue any instruction to the CPU, whereas here it does for x86. For other architectures, it will need to actually emit an instruction. There is another kind of dependency as well. So the other kind of dependency is called a data dependency. So a, a data dependency looks something like this. Let's say to begin with, we have uh, P is equal to the address of Q, Q is equal to three, uh, and then we have uh, also R equals five. Okay, so that's how we're starting things. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, say that let's say r equals seven and p equals ampersand r. And so over on CPU, what are we gonna do? We're going to print out what's the value and the value of star p. Uh, and if, if, if we look at it, really what we are doing is, right, if we look at the assembly language, it's gonna be something like, move P into some register, and then move uh, the indirect of P. So let's say, and so this, we have a data dependency. Right? We can see that we're putting P into EAX and then we're dereferencing de EAX. So you'd think there, the CPU can be smart enough to say, well, it, I better not reorder these but there are architectures when those can be reordered. So they, uh, uh, so on like a, a, a deck alpha CPU, you would actually need a read barrier, which seems crazy, but I guess allows them a lot of optimizations. So for something like that, the way that actually works uh, in Linux, which does support uh, processors of this type, they actually have a not just a read um, the barrier uh, macro, they also have a read barrier depends, okay, where the read barrier depends only uh, deals with this particular situation. So if you had something, you know, like print P, print star P, you would add in a, you know, read barrier depend. And this would turn into a read barrier only for architectures that require them for data dependency. This can be quite complicated, uh, no question. And so if you are writing multi-CPU code, like in a kernel, it behooves you to, to learn about this. The good news is uh, for us in terms of working with JOS and XV6, one, we don't have to worry about the compiler. And the reason we don't have to worry about the compiler is that we are doing um, no optimization. So we have a very low level of optimization. 
which won't do all these reordering of loads and stores. The other advantage we have is that we're using x86, so we don't have to worry about write barriers. And so much of this won't um, come up uh, for you, but know that it exists.